So I'd like to talk a bit today about uh, curiosity, uh, giving, and the joy of figuring things out. And I'd like to do this by telling you this incredibly nerdy story um, about how I developed this real-world piece of Star Trek-like technology uh, called a science tricorder um, in my spare time and then decided to give it away for free. <laughs> it's a really fun story. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, man. Um, <laughs> don't get me giggling. Um, so, um, most of you here have probably heard about Star Trek. Um, it's this wonderful science fiction TV series from the 1960s created by Gene Roddenberry. Um, and it has Captain Kirk and his science officer Spock, and they're sort of roaming around the galaxy getting into um, all sorts of trouble. Um, but the underlying theme of the show is this wonderful humanistic message that we're all basically the same, regardless of race, uh, gender, uh, color, what have you. Um, the vehicle for this message is this absolutely fantastic technology. Um, starships, these warp drives that allow you to travel faster than the speed of light, um, transporters that allow you to beam down onto different alien planets, and these scientific instruments called tricorders that I think are just absolutely wonderful, um, that sort of Spock would have carrying around him while he was exploring an alien planet to learn all sorts of different things about the planet, or say, strange neutron fields or something that were coming from a nearby star. Um, but of course, tricorders come in two different flavors. Um, and so there's the science tricorders that Spock would have, and then there's the medical tricorders that Bones, the, the doctor, would sort of have to scan you and diagnose you with all sorts of terrible illnesses that you contracted while roaming around these alien forests or what have you. Um, and so, uh, ever since I was a kid, these have just fascinated me. Um, I've always been very interested in them and interested in building a lot of this technology. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a father who's this wonderfully talented engineer, and he loved to share his love and his joy of building and making things with me from a very young age. And so, with this very long-term goal, very long-term goal, of creating a real Star Trek tricorder, I sort of set out to learn electronics. Um, and so over the years, eventually, my skills had sort of reached this strange critical mass where I was suddenly able to take on these very complicated projects on my own. Um, and so what happened is over about five years of grad school, sort of in my evenings and weekends and sort of the finest grad student tradition, I would go home uh, and do my laundry at my parents' house. And I would sort of borrow my father's uh, soldering iron and work on building these tricorders. Um, I developed a few different models. And of course, functionally, uh, unlike, they're a bit different from their 24th century uh, counterparts, but they have a lot of the same functions and that are generally grouped into about three different areas. And so um, they can sense atmospheric things, so uh, things like ambient temperature or pressure or humidity. Um, they can sense electromagnetic things, so uh, different properties about light or magnetic fields. And they can sense spatial things, so uh, different things about distance or location um, or motion. Um, and so <laughs> I haven't even said anything yet. Um, at some point in every creative project, um, you get the desire to share it with people. Um, and if you don't have this desire, uh, your friends will let you know. They'll sort of demand to know uh, why you've been acting so weird and um, where you've been spending all of your time and who you've been spending it with. And you'll, you'll have to have this sort of awkward conversation where you tell them that it's not actually a new girl, but it's this tricorder <laughs> that you've been building. <laughs> which is not a conversation you want to have, trust me. Um, it, it, it's sort of a very strange experience. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, very much like I was introduced, um, I decided to share these and make them open source and really give them away to people. Um, and so I created this website over a couple of months and uh, one night just put it online and posted it to my Facebook friends, um, went to bed and I woke up and what had happened was just absolutely, positively overwhelming. Um, I had woken up with about, I think over 24 hours, nearly 50,000 people had been uh, visiting this website to learn about science tricorders, to learn about science and building their own instruments. It was just unbelievably amazing. My website was overflowing, or my email address was overflowing 
with these wonderful emails faster than I could read them, half of which ended with the words live long and prosper. <laughs> I'm not, not even joking. Um, and it was also filled with these media requests, which was this very interesting experience for me, um, particularly in that when, uh, when the reporters sometimes couldn't get a hold of me very quickly, they would come to these wild conjectures, like that I was actually this time traveler from the future who had sort of stolen this technology and brought it back to the 21st century. Um, and I'm here today to tell you that that's true. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I was born in 1982, so it, it, we're all good. <laughs> we're all good. Um, I'd like to talk to you a bit about science. Um, the world is this beautiful place, and one of the most beautiful aspects about science for me is that while there's so much that we can see and smell and taste and touch, there's this inconceivably large universe full of things that we can't directly observe or easily observe. Things like magnetism, temperature gradients, but even crazier things like neutron fields and other things that they were just sort of uh, discovering in Star Trek. Um, and so I don't know if you've had this experience before, but oftentimes I'll be talking about somebody or talking to somebody about science. And Eventually, we'll get to this point in the conversation where they'll say, well, you know, I found that very interesting. I've always wanted to learn more about that, but I'm not very good at math. And because I wasn't very good at math, I couldn't continue on in a lot of my science classes in school. And so there's this large body of knowledge that I really don't have that I would love to have. I don't know about you, but that kind of makes me sad, but it, it also kind of concerns me a little bit, um, that there are all of these people wandering around who would love to have a basic conceptual level fluency of science and just aren't able to get it. And I understand why that happens. Right now, it's very difficult to visualize a whole bunch of different things, a whole bunch of different things that we can't directly observe, things like magnetism. And so if you want to learn about them, you really have to go to a book. You really have to, we sit you down in front of this textbook and you open it up and and we sort of give you a couple of rules, you know, magnetism, okay, opposites attract, likes repel, and then we give you this bunch of equations that describe magnetism and a bunch of problems to solve, and when you're done and you have an A, then we sort of say, all right, this person has learned about magnetism, we're done here. Um, I think we have to do something about this. Um, math and science are intimately coupled, and there's no two ways about that. But I don't think that that's the only way that we can go about teaching people. Um, and so my hope is that eventually we could come to creating an inexpensive device that kids could sort of walk around and keep close in a pocket or bag and sort of pull out whenever curiosity strikes so that um, you could turn a walk through the park into a nature walk, um, you could turn uh, dad's home repairs into a lesson about heat flow and really help kids develop this intuitive, conceptual level understanding about the world around them that can serve as this scaffold for understanding the mathematical formalisms later. Um, and so I'd like to show you something today. Um, this isn't quite ready for prime time yet, but I'd still like to show it because there's some neat stuff here. I think it's a first step along the way of helping visualize some things that don't require mathematics. Um, this is an experiment, uh, a new tricorder experiment that I've been working on. Um, here's another picture, but here's the actual device. Um, you can see it's quite small, and there's a lot of very fun things on here. Um, so one of the first things is something called an inertial measurement unit. Um, and what that does is it allows me to very accurately determine this device's position and its orientation, or where it's pointing in space. And so what can happen is I can sort of wave this around, and I get this motion path that describes where I've been waving it. Um, and so uh, one of the other things that's on here is this thing here at the top, and it's called a non-contact temperature sensor, which allows me to very accurately determine the temperature of whatever I'm pointing at. And so you can sort of see where I'm going with this. Say you were to stand in front of your stove, you're baking some cookies, and you get really curious. Um, you sort of wave this thing around your stove. Along with that motion path, at each point in that path, I can capture the temperature of whatever it happens to be pointing at. And so with a little bit of math um, and some algorithms, you can actually create a very low resolution, but extremely low cost, uh, something like a thermal image 
of whatever you were waving your device at. And so we can see that this image, again, it's not quite ready for prime time. It has a few artifacts in it. Uh, but if we overlay the picture of the stove on there, we can see all the right things are sort of in the right places. Uh, the really hot bits, uh, sort of 125C inside the stove, we can see those. Um, the 25C that's sort of around the counter, we can see that as well. Um, I think kids are absolutely going to love this. Um, this is another example. Uh, I kind of got excited. I pretended I was Zorro here um, while I was making the tool path. Um, and I'm standing in front of my fridge. Uh, the, the door on the top is sort of open. And if we have another look at that, um, here's the thermal image that we've generated. Um, you can see here the blue section is the cold section. It's about negative 3C. And the hot sections here are actually room temperature. They're the walls of my kitchen at 25C. Um, and so if we overlay the picture over top of that, we can see again, it's not quite perfect, but it's pretty close. The character of what we're trying to discover is there. Um, and so this is very exciting for me for a bunch of different reasons, one of which is that this is extremely low cost. It's somewhere between one or two orders of magnitude cheaper than doing this conventionally with a thermal camera. Um, but the thing that really excites me is that there's no particular reason why you have to make a thermal image. You can couple this general idea of image acquisition with a whole bunch of traditional sensors that you can't typically uh, inexpensively make an image for. So for example, if you wanted to try and make a magnetic image or an image of magnetic fields, there's no particular reason why that wouldn't be perfectly possible. So it's very exciting. Um, I'd like to really briefly close uh, by talking about giving. Um, as a creative type, and I happen to think that we're all creative types, it's just whether you've accepted that yet or not. Um, giving and sharing the projects that I work on is something that's very important to me. Uh, taking a step back, my teaching philosophy, the very best way that I know about teaching people is to get them excited about material. Because I know that when they get excited about it, they're going to run with it, and they're going to play with it. And playing and tinkering is the very best way I know to teach anyone anything new and get them fluent in it. And as a teacher, it's just this incredible high to get people excited about something and get them excited about science. And so giving and sharing and curiosity and getting people excited helps continue this cycle of the joy of figuring things out. Thank you.